The focus of this panel discussion is about cultural beliefs and protocols about information sh sharing when native, um, official native representatives visit institutions with collections and um, share information on these items and those collections. Uh, to, but to get there, we really need to provide a context for what is a collection visit, what is a consultation. So um, briefly, I was just going to share with you um, information on how uh, the Indian Arts Research Center at SAR has worked with these three gentlemen in different capacities in reviewing collections. Um, Gary Royball has um, worked with us in different ways, um, most recently on a project involving um, uh, the development of an exhibition on moccasins. Gary, uh, as I mentioned previously, is a moccasin maker, and um, he and other uh, moccasin makers from other southwestern tribes have come to IRC and reviewed the moccasin collection and provided different types of interpretation for that collection, which we have then um, included that information in our records for those, those items. And he's also been an excellent resource um, on paintings by Awasire and J.D. Royball, who's his father, and Awasire was his great uncle, uh, because at different times we get requests for the publication of these paintings. So we really work with Gary in determining, you know, what, which of these paintings are appropriate for, for publication. And uh, Jim Enote, uh, we are currently engaged in a, a long-standing project with him and Octavius Sawatawa from the Zuni tribe uh, in reviewing the entire Zuni collection at IARC. Um, the, the, the purpose of that is to provide Zuni cultural interpretation of this collection at IARC, and that information is then being put into our, each of our collection records, and it really enriches it by you know, providing things such as Zuni names, um, things like um, how do you handle certain items um, that may be of you know, special significance, and then also identifying items that may be subject to, rep to repatriation. And um, Lee Guanawisima has worked with IRC in uh, reviewing the Hopi Gatsina carving collection, and he provided a lot of cultural information and interpretation on that collection that is now also part of the records at the Indian Arts Research Center. So with that, I thought it would be a good idea if I asked um, uh, Lee to describe to us what is a typical visit for you when you go to view collections at an institution. Okay, thank you. Again, my, na my name is uh, Lee Kuanusilma, and um, as of March 18th, uh, I'm on my 25th year as the director for the Cultural Preservation Office. So it's been a long journey for me personally, uh, both professionally and you know, learning likewise as an individual. Um, as to the question, you know, when NAGPRA came into play, I literally didn't know anything about NACPRA until maybe perhaps a year later when museums began to make contact with the Hopi tribe. And uh, subsequently, we began to receive literally um, hundreds of um, worksheets, uh, computer, pretty much hard copies of inventories. We were beginning to receive some desk, but of course, our computers weren't compatible with the databases that were, that were being used by various museums. But out of that, we eventually ended up with almost 350 museums nationwide that held Hopi uh, collections, both um, ethnographic and archaeological. So one of the things that we learned uh, as far as um, Figuring out NAGPRA, its process, and how you deal with repatriation initially is, is really to, to, to simply sit down and assess the collections that we now had on paper. So one of the things that we uh, do pretty routinely nowadays and initially began was that of course we had the raw inventory and that helps us 
um, as assess and prioritize what we want to see when we visit museums. But literally when you get the databases and the inventories in some museums, there are literally thousands of items out there. And many of the um, actual items listed, we had some idea, but until you see them, you couldn't really fully assess them. Kachina dolls, for example, I visited a lot of museums and what we discovered in what is in the category of Kachina dolls are actually ritual dolls. And these are uh, ceremonial and esoteric kinds of um, um, quote dolls that is used during um, some of these uh, society, um, particularly during initiations. And we found out that those kind of items were, uh, were um, historically categorized into the Kachina doll collection. So that was one of the things that we learned uh, as we engaged in um, consultation. So we ended up prioritizing, and then we did our initial assessment, perhaps at the staff level. Uh, initial, some, sometime later, the museums began to invest in actual funding and resources to visit museums. But out of that, our job really wasn't quite over. We deal with 12 Hopi villages out on Hopi. We deal with 18 religious societies on Hopi. And we have 34 living clans. So you can imagine the level of consultation when our office begins to um, facilitate consultation internally. So that helps ultimately, but it's a huge uh, job for us to try to um, find individual people who, who might be the best knowledgeable people to help us. So that sort of in a, a capsule is how we uh, historically and through today have dealt with consultation. So you, you mentioned um, during this process you, you found some Kachina dolls that weren't you know, made for sale, that they had um, more special significance. So um, how, how do you, what do you do when you encounter these types of items and collections that may be culturally sensitive um, in the presence of museum staff? What, what is the interaction there? Well, when we engage in specific uh, consultation on, uh, again, what we uh, term to be ritual figurines or dolls, literally, uh, that's where the villages, the clans, and societies come in to help us. Under NAGPRA, of course, you've got to uh, have certain types of um, uh, evidence to proceed with repatriation. And of course, under NAGPRA, you have both the um, sacred object category as well as the cultural patrimony category. So that in itself, uh, necessitates some specific uh, groups or individuals to help us. Sometimes um, it's hard to argue that something is subject to repatriation when a museum demands a lot more than what the Hopi people are willing to give. For example, with the Peabody Museum up in Harvard, it took us 10 years to repatriate uh, flute societies uh, ritual items because they literally were hesitating to part with the collections. What ended in that particular situation was that the clan, flute clan from Walpi First Mesa had to now uh, go a bit further to try to uh, again voice their evidence. So what happened was that we actually hosted them for a flute dance ceremony and then after that, uh, under very careful guarded conditions, the um, Peabody Museum personnel were allowed to see the existing paraphernalia, uh, I guess you could call them the ceremonial bundle that held pretty much a lot of the figurines and others to convince Peabody that what they had in their position was indeed uh, flute clan paraphernalia. So again, it took that level of effort to actually finally repatriate those items back to Hopi. 
Can you add something to that? No. You asked about the when the, the work is going on to actually review some items and collections and what is the relationship with some of the staff especially, I have to think back about the history of the relationships with museums and collection centers to begin with. And I think most of us know that, that history, uh, that sort of colonial artifact, that concept and idea of building collections that represent a culture or group and a kind of a sense of ownership <coughs> that goes with that. So that's what we're dealing with to begin with. And NAGPRA came in, and I think we all know also that that didn't mean that everybody is going to be happy to work with Indian tribes. It just meant that they had to, if they, if they had some certain conditions of their collections, federal funding and so on, that they had to engage tribes. So all, already, while it was a big step forward, there was still the sort of staid old school museums and there are the progressive advanced, this is what we should do kind of museums. So we've encountered both. And, but these days, you know, when we do start working with, with staff and we come across items that are certainly sensitive even for us, to see them, there is, we by then have to develop a relationship with the staff. I mean, there are some staff, as I said, that are old school and that are not creating any kind of enabling environment for, for something to work. They put up barriers. They make it difficult. There are people like that, believe it or not. There are those that say, more uh, uh, junior staff that might say, this is what we should be doing, but he or she is not about to retire anytime soon. <laughs> yeah. And so we have to deal with those. But with the, the right kind of people, this is very much a people activity, obviously. We have the physical, we have the record, whether it's card catalogs, pages or on disks or databases or I don't know, in the cloud. We have the items, of course, that are living in many cases. And then we have people. And so the people part of this, when we come across the things that are sensitive, we by then, we hope, have a relationship because we have to have trust with the people that we are working with because sometimes we have to, we have this difficult stumbling encounter with words. We have to develop a new grammar, a social grammar, a museum, source community, this whole new thing, and almost inform the staff as well that, well, even we're not supposed to handle this or only this member of our group can handle this, I can't touch this, and yet you have already been handling it and touching it and moving it. We have to inform them. Um, and we are thinking now that there's almost, and I think in the field, a, a movement towards some sort of guidelines, and I don't know if the, uh, if there's nothing that you take an oath of secrecy about, but sometimes we tell you, we, we need to put this somewhere. It has to be dealt with this way. We don't even tell our own people this. So this creates a clumsy, awkward situation for us, which is a space that is still unfulfilled and is incomplete. But we do need to work towards some sort of new grammar, behavior, sort of thing, because we're certainly having to trust you. So as part of th this, this relationship building and this trust that you're trying to, to um, establish, um, I would assume that as part of this process, uh, as you get to that point where you really trust someone, you, al you also, you, you are sharing information with museum staff. So in these visits, 
you know, depending on whether it's the first visit or your last visit, how do you, you know, as, a, as, as someone who's sharing information, determine what is appropriate to share or not to share? For any one of you. I guess at this point, um, sometimes it is, you work with uh, people and talk to them about certain things in the collections that are either just general information or sometimes there's sensitive information in the collections or in the records. And you have to make some of these people understand what the information is about that you're talking about. Or you need to work with the staff, like, like Jim saying, get to know the staff and be able to trust them in many ways of what you should or shouldn't say or what you should or should not put on the records. And I think um, working with museums over the years from the tribal side, I mean, there's, there's a certain level of information that we can provide um, to the staff to write into their records. I, I know I've worked with a number of uh, collections over the years and I've seen a lot of information in their Kellogg records that, you know, and some there's nothing on the record. Sometimes there's a few lines, just general information. Sometimes there's very detailed information in the records. And sometimes I look back in time some of how far these records go. Um, and I'm sorry to say sometimes our own individuals, uh, maybe tribal elders may have been asked to provide some of this information and given a lot of detailed information. And I think at this, I see it as it's good and bad sometimes because sometimes this information that is provided also goes into uh, exhibit text and is written. And what do you do from there? I mean, it's a fine line sometimes. We, as advisors or and, and as well as people coming from the communities who do know a lot about the dances, the songs, the history, and a lot of sensitive, sensitive information is there. Sometimes people have provided some of those information to the general public, and it get, goes out there. People know it. I know um, working with uh, Cynthia in, at SAR, looking at the moxin making uh, collection, moxin collections that they have, sometimes there's very little information on the moxins. And depending on what tribe that moxin came from, there is a lot or there's none. So I, I guess as, as a tribal person, coming from my home village or elsewhere, we have to be very careful what we put in there because it will, it, in some points, it will come out. But if you have people like Cynthia and others in the staff who know about some of the collections, they can come back to you and say, is this appropriate or not? And, 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 and that's a good thing that I see from SAR is that for certain things that my, my father, J.D. Royball, my great uncle, Alfonso Royball, um, they have a lot of collections and they come back to me and ask me, is this, is this appropriate or not? And I think that's where the staff comes into play, where they need to be aware of some of the information that might go out there. And other museums don't. But I know I've worked with um, um, National Museum of the American Indian at uh, their Cultural Resource Center a number of years ago. And we did set up a protocol, especially with their three-dimensional objects, um, archaeological material and ethnographic material, and did a short session with their staff and say what they should handle, how they should handle it, and who should handle it. Many of the Pueblo fetishes in their collections, we asked that none the women shouldn't handle some of those collections, or a pregnant lady shouldn't get close to it, 
only men should handle some of the human remains. So those kind of pro protocols have been placed in certain museums. Others, they don't. And that's the danger. So I wanted to go back to something um, Lee said earlier that was uh, a little bit surprising to me, was the, um, the situation with the Peabody and where you had to actually have a ceremony in order to, in a sense, um, justify you know, the repatriation of the, this particular um, item. It, it seems to me that that's, um, in terms of information sharing, that's at the way, the way extreme end of the spectrum. And is that something, um, was, that, was that the only way that you felt that it could be, that the repatriation could be accomplished? And, and um, have you had other instances where that had to occur as well? Well, initially with the uh, collection that uh, we're talking about here, I thought we had enough um, preponderance of evidence in terms of looking at it of, uh, literally uh, during one of our visits up to the museum. Um, we supplied them with literature, but you know they, they um, balked. Um, and and the, the situation was that this was an archeological collection versus something that was collected directly from the village. But that, that this collection came from the Cayenta, Arizona area, and it was <coughs> a cache of items in a huge um, pottery. And, and, and what was interesting with that was that the uh, local flute society in First Mesa um, still had songs about this portion of the, the altar that we, they were interested in, but didn't have it physically. So we thought that we had enough ethnographic information, but as I explained, it, it, it just resulted in more questions to the tribe or to the, in particular to the clan. So it was really frustrating for all of us. Uh, and they, they, they went that far, and yes, it is a very extreme example of how sometimes the tribe, what tribes are actually faced with in terms of arguing that these are subject to NAGPRA. So, Lee, Lee with, that's really unfortunate that you had to do that with Peabody. Mm -hmm. As, as we, we've begun to start working with more and more museums and collections, would you do that again? Well, we're, we're still continuing, of course, the consultation um, with a lot of museums. Um, one thing that, you know, of course, helps all of us is that, one, the, well, we have frustrations within uh, NAGPRA, for example. I think the Hopi tribe uh, continues to uh, engage in consultation, uh, exercising the best professional kind of consultation. Um, sometimes tribes are still pretty emotional about um, collections particularly the human remains uh, category. But if you're gonna accomplish uh, a good relationship, then you've got to also make that effort to, like Jim, uh, you said, you've got to establish a relationship with the staff as well. With the Hurt Museum, for example, I went before the Board of Trustees to um, educate them on, on, on some of our Kachina friends that we were interested in repatriating. And of course, at that level, um, half of the Board of Trustees uh, were bulking as well. And of course, the question was whether or not the Board of Trustees would support the Hopi tribe repatriation request uh, by allowing deaccession. That was the specific um, motion on the table as to whether or not the museum Board of Trustees would be willing to go that first step, which was to deaccession the the, uh, well, the, the items and then subsequently facilitate NAGPRA. So one thing that I, I was sitting there at the board room, I mean, I was asking myself, wow, what if they don't? What did they vote against it? You know, that was my question and it narrowly passed at that time in 96 or 97, you know, and this was another 
little minister that I didn't know was now a, a clear, um, in that case, an obstacle for repatriation. So it's a learning, um, it's lessons learned throughout the, um, again, in regard, uh, around the collaboration and trying to work within the uh, uh, guidelines of NAGPRA. You know, the Southwest has been one of the earliest places of study of anthropology, ethnography, and archaeology. And you would think, and we, we still are hopeful, that the Southwest, Santa Fe, Heard, Museum of Northern Arizona, and certainly uh, School for Advanced Research, and all these museums in this area could be bellwethers for helping to lead the change. I mean, you are very well positioned for that. Well, following up to that, what are your some of your suggestions in helping to lead that change? Say that again. I said, following up to that statement, what are some of your suggestions to these institutions in helping to lead that change? You're asking me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one is certainly developing new kinds of relationships that not simply, it's not only just writing a letter that as a matter of course and because of NAGPRA you have to work with culturally affiliated tribes, but actually taking the initiative to learn about the people, the staff, to learn about Lee, myself, Gary, to learn something more about why these things are important to us. And this is where <coughs> The, um, I guess the sense that items and collections either belong to humanity or they belong to the source community. And of course there are things in collections that were collected legitimately and we want the museum to have them, we want to be represented in these places but today also with young people learning about themselves, a young Zuni going online and learning about their identity through information that is incorrect, um, or looking at an image of something they're not supposed to see. That's really troubling for us. Information is moving much more quickly than it used to. And this is a time where we can't say that, well, the the letter is of, of itself a form of communication. It isn't complete. The, a database or website isn't a complete form of information. We've got to have a new sense or a new generation of mutual understanding. So the field is broadening. It's not all completely science. It's not all completely social or cultural. It is very much a part of having understanding. So there is a place to be filled yet, a sense of mutual understanding. We're starting to get there, mm -hmm. even having this convening and this opportunity to speak with each other is leading towards some sense of mutual understanding. Maybe we need more of this. Well, on that, that positive note, uh, I'll direct this question to Gary. Um, can you tell us about uh, a situation where you have visited a collection or an institution with a collection from your community and it was a, a great visit that, you know, what, it was very po a positive experience? Uh, well, well, before I um, get into that, I think I sort of follow up with Jim is saying that um, I think museums and museum staff have to understand that since NAGPRA came into being is that um, museums had this mindset that tribes were gonna come into their collections and claim everything, which is not the case. And it probably will never be the case. I think they're, they're more into wanting to look at uh, the sacred objects, uh, human remains that they would bring back home that would probably items would be repatriated back to where they came from. And I, I think that's one of the things that museums, uh, even overseas, uh, have that mindset that once they, they do open the doors that 
tribes were just going to come in and take everything. And um, and something that I think they have to know from the fact that tribes are looking at specific things in their collections, but not everything. But uh, the, to answer uh, Cynthia's question is um, working as I was working at the uh, National Museum of the American Indian at the Cultural Resource Center, um, I had a chance back in 2002 and three, and as a matter of fact, Cynthia was working there then to do have a work detail at the Cultural Resource Center uh, as a repatriation specialist. And my job at the time was to welcome tribal rep representatives that came from different tribes to come to DC and look at their collections. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, that they would um, identify objects that would be repatriated back to the tribes. So my job, as well as others in that repatriation program, was to set up viewing sessions, um, be able to uh, send them a list of inventory objects that they want to look up up close. And when the day came, they would view their collections. And one of them was my, my representatives from San Alfonso, as well as other pueblos that do, did come to NMAI, but even to the Natural History Museum in DC that the, the staff there was very welcoming and they engage in uh, working with the tribal representatives at every level, um, walking them in, uh, having a uh, get together with the, the staff and the director and helping the rep representatives to look at their collections up close and be able to engage in that kind of rapport, as well as even uh, helping them identify some of these objects. Um, on the other hand, um, I know at Natural History, uh, one of the tribes, uh, at this matter of fact right now, is, is working with the Natural History staff to repatriate a couple of their uh, religious objects. And one of the things that the museums have to provide is a is a research um, paper before everything can be repatriated, and the amount of information that they they have in the paper before it gets repatriated is a lot of information, too much. I mean, there's there's so much information out there, like like Jim said that you know in the early 1900s a lot of these collections were were brought, taken to D.C. or other areas, and all of that information is there. They do research, and everything's written out, every detail from the, of the collection, or where they came from, what it was used for. And it's mind-boggling to see that kind of information that's out there. And many of us as tribes don't even know <laughs> what's out there sometimes. But, but in the wrong run, I mean, we had had a very good relationship with the uh, NMEI and the natural history. And um, fortunate, working with my tribal representatives, a few objects have been repatriated recently. And uh, some of them are pending right now. But because of the staff being very aware and want to work with the tribes who do come in, it's, it's easier to work at that level because they, they welcome you and they want to work with you. And I've worked with other museums that just uh, just the opposite. It seems like they don't want to open their doors. They don't want us to look at the collections and making it hard for a tribe to, to deal with the staff sometimes. That's rare, but majority of the staff do want to work with you on a one-to-one -one basis. So the, in this age of information sharing where you can find almost anything on the internet, um, what have been some of your experiences in working with museums and um, you know, whether it's information that already exists in their records or information you share with them, um, what has been your experience in, in you know, negotiating with that institution to keep that information private? Is there anybody? Yeah. Jump, jump the wall. Um, thank you. Um, 
When we began to actually get the uh, uh, information from the museums, um, our office made an effort to go throughout the 12 Hopi villages to try to educate them. And one of the things that I talked about during, uh, I think, 93 thereabouts was the fact that not only is the Hopi tribe dealing with the actual physical objects, but we're also now having to deal with, again, um, uh, ethnographic information that was in public domain, primarily some of the early ethnographic work on research on Hopi doc documented so much uh, information. Um, we're faced with, for example, a current issue with the uh, Smithsonian in which they uh, have wax cylinder recordings of uh, our uh, winter ritual songs. And, and, and so the question came in, you have the object, but you also got a, a complementary information that for a long, long time was public domain. How do you deal with it when, when you are faced with esoteric information that is treated as public domain? So in 1994, we went before the Tribal Council, and the Tribal Council passed a resolution basically asserting proprietary rights to protect esoteric information. So that was declared by the Hopi Tribal Council. The only thing we could do within that resolution was to request that the museums take a look at that, those kind of material um, and make some decisions to, to try to uh, um, and develop guidelines on how best to honor the Hopi tribe's desire to protect that information. It's slow, but that was something that happened back in 1994. So, um, so that was one, one way that we, we dealt with, again, something that many people don't really think about is really the, the, the existing public domain material um, that is easily uh, accessed. Some, of course, have now on internet. Um, an individual came out and um, um, pretty much uh, wrote a book about Hopi altars. And, and I finally um, no, uh, caught up with him out on Hopi. And he had done his um, uh, field work, field research. So he was kind of sarcastic with me when I learned what he was researching. And he said, well, Lee, you don't have to worry about me anymore because I'm, I've done my work, I'm going back to Germany. So sometimes uh, it, it becomes this bigger, bigger question of going beyond your jurisdiction, which you have very little legal recourse in terms of protection. You know, this, I think, is something that sh should be brought up around rights also, some maybe human rights some kind of justice, I don't know, there seems like to be a, a field of justice for almost everything, but why is it that the Holocaust museums can restrict access to some items, that is family information, that families didn't want, don't want revealed, that happened during the times of the, the camps and the horrible things that happened in their history. Why can't we say we don't want this information made public? Why is that? Hmm. Well, I think that at this point, um, I'd like to segue a bit, it's still related, a related converse to this um, panel discussion, but it's something I think that's probably um, uh, of, of um, interest to the audience here because it's been in the news recently and it's and it is related to what we've been discussing. Uh, recently, there was an auction of um, items of significant cultural importance to the Hopi and other pueblos in Paris, and. Um, <laughs> One of the things that I recall about that is in trying to get information on what was going on, I pulled up a New York Times 
um, article and there were images right there <laughs> of what was being auctioned. And I immediately just clicked off on it because for me, you know, as a Pueblo woman from, from San Felipe Pueblo, I should not be looking at these, these, these items. And um, so that was, you know, that was, um, I guess, just another indication of the misunderstanding or the misinformation or the non-information that exists about, um, you know, of Pueblo culture and the beliefs associated with Pueblo culture. And I think we're in a really great position here. We have, you know, three representatives that are very informed about um, this particular situation in, um, that happened in Paris recently. So I was hoping I could just open up the table to, for some further discussion about that um, and for you to share some of your viewpoints on it. Yeah, let me uh, take the, the lead on that. Um, and of course, uh, the um, Hopi tribe and the Hopi people are still reeling from of course, the um, auction itself. Um, the tribe went as far as filing a lawsuit in French court to try to stop the auction, but of course, um, failed. Uh, we didn't. We 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 failed to stop the auction. One of the th areas that um, I think exists, even with the auction, is an open question as to whether or not. For example, institutional within the museum community as to whether or not any museum could prove to the Hopi tribe and other tribes that um, what the court, French court said was a certificate of rightful possession. You know, under NAGPRA, of course, the law immediately recognizes, quote, ownership of many of the material in held in uh, museum collections. And that's an open question still yet as to whether or not any museum can prove to the Hopi tribe that within their accession history that, they, that the Hopi villages, the societies, the clans gave um, consent on the removal of many of these items. I haven't heard one museum tell me that. So when the French, uh, Paris auction opened up, that was something that we tried to argue that indeed what was being auctioned off were patrimony. That because they are declared patrimony, it's our feeling that the tribe, the clans, the villages, and the societies never willingly gave up any kind of rights to those items. And that was our argument. Um, um, but of course, uh, I finally read the French, um, the English version of the uh, court decision and some very interesting discussion apparently ensued over in French court. One was French law, which basically said, well, you've got a French uh, family that um, had a certificate of rightful possession. So under French law, anything that is argued, argued to be uh, of, 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 of emotional, spiritual value, once it's commodified in, in French court, it loses its sacredness. That's what the French court said, so they treated again and basically moved towards defining what the Hopis were trying to argue as sacred to simply be art. It had a commercial value because that's what happened within the time that this family had possession, that it had somehow under French law lost its sacredness. Secondly, the Hopi tribe, of course, was not a direct party to the lawsuit. Um, but we did have a representative there, so that was another consideration where the Hopi tribe um, was not a very direct party, was represented, and the arguments was Hopi, but we're not a direct party to the lawsuit. So that was factored in. So it was um, something that, again, reinforces my um, thinking here is that the collection history, going back to the turn of the century and beyond, when there was a huge collecting frenzy nationwide. People came in simply under funding by uh, major museums to come to Hopi. Um, there was no, there's no evidence of any 
federal permission to do that from the 1880s, and certainly after 1906, except for the Peabody Museum that went into a what over for three years to excavate, no museum or no collector had any kind of evidence of uh, at least having a uh, antiquities permit. So a lot happened within that history. So I've always had that question to myself as to whether or not if the Hopi can prove and argue that no museum has ever shown the Hopi tribe that they lawfully and legally collected these items, that these items, sacred items, cultural patrimony items, are not subject to NAGPRA. You know, that's my thinking right now, and I think with the Paris auction where we argued that these items uh, have been illegally removed from the whole preservation. Um, it's my position now and my, um, uh, to the Hopi Tribal Council and our religious uh, leaders, clans, so forth, that the Hopi tribe needs to be more aggressive in, in dealing with um, repatriation. And, and so again, the Paris auction um, raised that question internationally. Um, I just got a text again from my, my staff just this morning saying that there's another auction in the United States of two, again, similar items. So will we ever learn? You know, I mean, that's, that's what's so mind-boggling when the Hopi tribe um, went public with, with the issue. But again, how do we deal with it um, nationally here and now internationally? We'd really like to do more more work with Lee on this. There's there's a lot of gaps in this system, in this in these ideas or and concepts of ownership, the concepts of even standards and laws and such. There's big spaces and gaps, and this has been a heartbreaking time in our history. Well, we hope there's some lessons learned, as, as Lee was saying. So we were attempted, Lee with his great team, advisors and people at Hopi, we know there's a way to go at this head on with, with the law and that hasn't worked. There's been the diplomacy where the embassy, right, asked the auction house to delay <coughs> until more information could be gathered. People said, get the State Department involved. The State Department can't even stop killing in the Sudan and Syria. They're not going to get involved in commerce. The, the shaming of people are going public and uh, circulating petitions trying to shame the auction house. And it's been an uphill struggle, really uphill. And I, I believe strongly in all of those, especially in, in Lee's work and the, the need to strengthen these, these laws. I, I took a step back and thought for a while and said, well, maybe I can tr contribute another front. And that was buyer beware. That any of these items, even if they're lookalikes, shouldn't be auctioned. They shouldn't be out there. But I'm saying buyer beware because of many museums that we have doing reviews of and looking at ceremonial objects, ceremonial things, sacred things, at least for Zuni, only Zuni, at least for Zuni, the majority have been fakes. And that because maybe it's just a circumstance at Zuni in the early 1900s that there was a trader that was, well, created an underground industry of fabricating some pieces. 
because there were collectors going to Zuni and wanting to collect uh, ceremonial things to represent Zuni culture. And of course, they would go to an English speaker and those were often the traders at Zuni. And the traders, I can imagine them saying, you want something ceremonial? I can get you something ceremonial by three o'clock. <laughs> and, and they did, and so they did provide some of these collectors with things that were replicas, fakes. So they're out there. So this is only, only a Zuni anyway. But we've seen a number of them, the replicas. So just another approach. And we need to come at this with multiple fronts. The shaming, the diplomacy, the law, and others. But also at the pocketbooks. Say that, well, if you're going to be a collector or a seller, that the items you have may not be authentic. And the only people that can authenticate them are the experts from the source. If the provenience, if the provenance, if the context you have is so is usually so sketchy, it is. If that says Cushing, Stevenson, etc., collected this and they got it from here or there, that isn't enough. Because we've seen where they have been taken. We've seen where Hodge also had some items fabricated. And so we, we've actually seen some of those and we have the written record of those where some of you may be familiar with Hodge, the Hodge expedition, things like that. But they had things actually replicated. So we know at Zuni anyway, there are a lot of replicas out there. And the only people that can authenticate them are Zuni experts. So buyer beware. So we're coming at it as multiple fronts. You know, of course, what's driving everything and has always driven this kind of issue is the uh, art market. And um, how, do you, how do you deal with it when it seems so easy to commodify a tribal religious items and suddenly, you know, we're faced with these kind of issues. So I think the art market needs to be, again, a listener to the uh, issues raised with the Paris auction. You know, ethics sometimes isn't good enough. You know, we wonder as on this Paris auction, for example, because we did, of course, the only, the only resource we had was the actual photos. So based on our best assessment, we felt that these were of Hopi origin. The question I have right now, did that come back to bite us? Because the Hopi tribe now was very public in arguing that these are of Hopi origin, meaning that we somehow authenticated it. You know, one item, the minimum bid, as you know, was 65000 to begin with. It sold for $250,000. You know, so I wonder about what we, or what, you know, what happened over with the Paris auction. You know, right now it's um, another challenge to try to figure out where all these items went. It was bad enough trying to deal with a collection as a whole, but now, of course, the dilemma is it's all scattered now. But the tribe has still is of the position that we have never, never relinquished in the white man's way proprietary interests and ownership of those items. We've never, never relinquished that. We've never waived it. We never gave it up. We felt and still feel that these have been illegally removed from the whole preservation because they're cultural patrimony. Not one indiv no one individual Hopi can part with it because we have a communal ownership of these items. What I see from the, the Paris uh, auction, um, it does break my heart being from the Rio Grande Pueblos. Um, and like uh, Cynthia said, there are certain things that in our public world 
men and women do not see or not supposed to see. But at the same time, um, seeing what the Paris auction did, it sort of blows my mind because there's more out there that we don't know about that are in private hands or other institutions uh, across the country. And I think like Jim has said, I think the, the Native nations in the United States uh, through our maybe uh, NCAI or others to help the cause of the tribes along with Hopi to maybe work with um, United Nations or indigenous groups to help make this cause stronger. Um, because we know that you know, our laws do not go across the ocean. They stop. And how do we do that? We need help from you know, others that, can, that may know where some of these collections are or even tribes go across the ocean and looking at collections held by different institutions. And I know some have. I know, I know there's a lot um, of antiquities that are out, out there that we don't even know about, or there's hundreds of them, thousands of them. So I, I think from my point of view, like I said, uh, it broke my heart <coughs> to see it. And like Jim and Lee said, I mean, we can't stop. We can't stop trying. We need more help and by people who, who have support and want to help in terms financially as well as emotionally and, and be able to try and get better and stronger laws to, to deal, with these, deal with these kind of things. Because it's going to happen again. Paris is not going to be the only place. Other places are going to, and but at the same time, I think this is a rude awakening to other museums across the nation and overseas. Is that they may not even do any of, any more of these kind of auctions of Hopi stuff as well as others, because they're afraid that it's going to open up another can of worms. But we got to try, and we can't stop because there's a lot of things in. Museum, pr private hands as well institutions that tribes have not looked at that maybe they will consider to uh, repatriate as well. And Lee and Jim have been in the Southwest the forefront of, of trying to return some of those items. I'm just sort of getting into it. And I've, I have helped tribes and I'm working with tribes right now to repatriate a few items. Um, but. It's, it's an uphill battle, but we've got to continue doing it. And I think people like yourself who are here could help us out as well as, as private in, um, individuals. That there are a lot of stuff in the collections that need to come back home. They don't need to be in museum uh, in private hands. Because and from my own experience as well as my tribal leaders, telling me is that there are some collections that are in museums that could harm people because certain people in our communities and societies are only the only ones that should handle some of those material. And that's the mindset that I come from because it's important and we need to continue doing that. Well, I'd like to thank Lee and Gary and Jim, who had to rush to the airport for being the panelists today. We really appreciated the information you shared. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to our audience. Um, I hope this was an enlightening experience for you. And we hope to see you at our next speaker series talk. Thank you.